everybody, and welcome to Know Your Moves. It's about time we finally got to say that. This is a series all about unpacking Super Smash Brothers characters, their history, and the design of how they appear in Super Smash Brothers. And I'm finally excited to say that the series is back. But I'm not alone. This time around, it's a collaboration between myself and Source Gaming. So say hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Hello, Hello. Hello there. I will not get used to that, but also say hi to our new, highly skilled editor, the Duke of Dorks. Hello, everyone. Beautiful. Now, the series is back in full force. Let's talk about one of the largest additions to the Smash Brothers series thus far. You're so go? This? I, nor did anyone think we'd have a contrasting cast of cascading characters coming together to clash concluding 2018 commandingly. Nintendo has brought together an amazing cast of characters, but most notably, heroes and each of their eternal villains some of which are almost more popular than the protags. You have the best video game daddy of them all, the convoluted king of the Koopas, Bowser. You have the self-proclaimed noble and expert at clobbering, King DDD. And of course, the old lug, the man in himself, Ganon. That's my, that's my dad. But while all of these guys are bad guys, that doesn't necessarily mean they are bad. However, we have one that is truly horrifying, truly something that could give Nightmare Nightmares a monster so unforgiving and truly deserving of the villain a moniker. That's right, Smash Brothers' biggest loser, the eternal rival of both of the Samuses, Ridley. So Ridley's a weird character for Nintendo, he certainly doesn't fit the usual mold of the other popular Nintendo characters on either side of the morality spectrum. He's big, he's menacing, he's monstrous in a scarily realistic way, but despite this, he's a big fan favorite of Metroid fans. And it's, uh, it's still weird. You see, most of Nintendo villains, you see them in Smash, are the main villains of the series, or at least it started that way. Ridley is not like this. He is certainly the most reoccurring enemy that Samus exhaustively exclaims, God damn it again? as he's appeared as a boss in nine games, including the pinball one, but with the exception of one. He's never truly the ultimate villain, <laughs> you know what I mean? He's always overshadowed by Mother Brain, Dark Samus. Mother Brain as a human, or not as dark, Dark Samus. Ridley is more like the Goma of his series, like a reoccurring boss who always shows up looking mostly the same with a few new tricks up his sleeve. But generally, when fighting them, it's the same strategy to defeat them. One of the other differences between him and many of the other Nintendo baddies is he is a real monster. Bowser? Funny. Ridley? I'ma eat your dad. Like, this is how we'd see monsters. Mario and Link, they fight these weird creatures that you could call monsters, but they're more goofy because they're tripping over their own feet. In Metroid, though, Samus is an independent, lone, human woman, a bounty hunter who's constantly fighting against aliens who only want to eat her. And Ridley? Yeah, he wants this as badly as he wants dessert. Because Samus' parents were the main core. He ate Samus' parents. Maybe this is why people like him. They don't relate to him, but they like him in the same way that people like the Xenomorphs from the Alien series, which really was partially based on. He is scary and he's dark, and it's cool, especially in a baby poop game like Smash. Speaking of Ridley's history with the Smash series, just remember, if people are telling you what you want to achieve is impossible, they said that about Ridley too, and even he's out here killing Mario now. Actually, funnily enough, Ridley's been one of the few newcomers that's been in every game since the original. I'm not making this up, he was slowly creeping his way to being playable. He was in Smash 64, way off in the background there. But what really sparked it was the glorious CG opening to Melee. It was beautiful, and the eye candy is Samus fighting her longtime rival? It can't be matched. Here, fans got their first glimpse of what a 3D Ridley could look like, stealing a baby Metroid the whole nine yards. Except we also saw that he could exist beside Samus without looking too weird. And all we got was a, a trophy, that's, yep. You thought on Brinstar everything was going to shit, like, yeah, that would've been a good boss fight, but no. Well, that's okay, because Melee just added villains like Bowser and Ganondorf. Surely, Ridley would come into the next game as more than a trophy, and he's just a boss. He's two bosses. They're generally the same boss fight. Sure, Subspace gave us two Ridley boss battles, and yes, they were fun, and yes, they represented the character accurately, but somehow they thought more Metroid representation meant putting in a skimpier Samus. Sakurai even planned for Ridley to be an assist trophy in this game. So, surely Sakurai was showing interest and love for the character. So, next time he would be playable, right? Boss characters make appearances in other stages, not just this one. 
Ah, uh, the Ridley debate. This, this is where I had my start. You were so right, just at the wrong time. Unfortunately, before this, we were smacked in the face with a raw turkey stage boss in the pain of Pyrus Beard. Why this model? Why other M? Why are your wings so spiky? Why does it look like you talk like this? Yep. In Super Smash Bros. for Wii U, Ridley appeared as another boss. Except there's no story mode! On a stage, nobody went to play. The fiery keep of the dragon! This time, though, he had a stock icon, which means he could be KO'd like a character. As you may expect, fans took this very poorly. It felt like this was the final tail nail in the coffin. And for you guys out there that may not know, unlike most fan requests for characters, Ridley is one of the few that Sakurai has actually acknowledged multiple times. However, his words were a little less hopeful. In an interview with Nintendo Power, Sakurai was asked about Ridley being a playable character and jokingly called him impossible. Maybe if they tried really hard it would happen, but he would have to be very small and very slow. Then, in a later interview with IGN, Sakurai more seriously explained that Ridley wouldn't work as a fighter. And while he didn't directly say this, many fans took one message from this interview. Ridley is too big. And I know what you're gonna say, why does this matter? Huh, Olimar's actually the size of a bottle cap. The Pokemon were enlarged from their canonical sizes. Ganondorf's a frickin' big chungus. Well, it all comes down to how Sakurai wants to make fighters feel in Smash Brothers. Not just Ridley. He believes characters need to encapsulate the essence of the fighters. And for Ridley, size and flying freely kind of go hand in hand. Now these two things, obviously, that would be very broken if put into Smash Brothers. But if it wasn't like that, Sakurai felt that the threatening aspects of Ridley, large parts of his design, would be absent. And thus, he couldn't do the character justice. Thus, he was often relegated to a boss or a stage boss. However, Sakurai is a man willing to go against the impossible even against his own prior decisions if it means he can please fans. So this creates an interesting scenario for us here on Know Your Moves. As you know, Sakurai is usually very keen at representing characters as accurately as possible to how they appeared in their games. It's for authenticity, so people recognize the traits from their games to how they appear in Smash. But with Ridley, time and time again, when they try to communicate him in Smash, it's always being contested because being playable would take away the traits that make Ridley so threatening. So, does Sakurai succeed? Did he make Ridley playable while also communicating the traits he's most known for? As Ridley appears in Smash Bros Ultimate, does Ridley represent his appearances from his games? Is he threatening, gigantic, and menacing? I don't know, that's why we have part two. The easiest place to start is his appearance in the question of whether Ridley is truly terrifying. His moves do have some origins, however, a bulk of his appearance was crafted based off a mixture of appearances, delivering an authentic, playable Ridley. At first, it may seem a bit off because he's no longer the hulking menace he was in his games. In fact, he's nearly the height of Samus. So what do they do to make Ridley reflect the revolting ruthless ringleader he's represented from his recent and time-worn appearances? Well, Sakurai took what he had with a smaller Ridley and exaggerated many of his notable traits. Ridley's overall design in Smash is unique, taking elements from various appearances. His primary inspiration is Super Metroid, with his scaly purple skin, wings, and skeleton-like body, where you can basically see his ribcage. He also has a much longer forehead and a silver spiked tail as seen in other M. So this sort of makes him an amalgamation of all the non-prime versions of Ridley. And this is sort of a Smash staple. We see this with other villains like Bowser, DK, and even K. Rule. But I think the best example is comparing Ridley's Brawl model with the Smash Ultimate one. It's funny how his Brawl model is the one that looks more cartoony. In Ultimate, he's got cracks under his eyes, muscles under his scales, Ugh. It looks disgusting, and the sound effects take that squint to a cringe, with bone crackling in his downtime, Ugh. Also, his voice clips, similar to other beastly bosses, have a tendency to make inaudible animalistic screeches. Although in my headcanon, Ridley's always had that Iago vibe. Bring the guns, the weapons, the knives, and uh, how about this picture? I don't know, I think I'm making a weird face in it. However, some of you less red fans will be surprised to know that Ridley isn't just some munch munch give me a Samus tenderloin, no, he's actually very smart, he's cunning, and he can speak when he wants to. However, Smash decided to make him screech like the dinosaur monster he appears as, likely to reinforce the overall image of the character. He acts and moves like a vicious, raving, rabid animal, and the closest thing I hope we get to a raving, rabid character. Let's move on to his animations. He sits slouch in his standard idle animation from the 2D games, and stumps or flies around the battlefield when on the move. Even other animations look very animal-esque, my personal favorite being him sleeping like an overgrown kitty cat. Is it just a purple dinosaur thing to be modeled after cats? 
On the topic of Ridley's appearance, he has eight colors in total, including two cut costumes that only appeared in the demo, although they have the same references as the costumes they were replaced with. His default purple appearance is the one we see in Super and Other M, then his next alt is a new costume being Meta Ridley from Metroid Prime. Next, his red alt, based off the artwork from Super Metroid. His dark blue alt is based off a of Neo Ridley from Metroid Fusion. His green outfit is most likely a reference to his sprite in Zero Mission. And then this purple one, it's a reference to his NES sprite, with the green wings. His final two alts are based off of Ridley-related objects, the first being a golden Ridley, based on the Ridley statue from Super Metroid, and finally, the white version of Meta Ridley. This is based off of the Ridley robot in Zero Mission. While some of his moves have clear references like his specials, most of his attacks, uh, they don't. I understand why, though. Ridley's concept and how he appears speaks more than any specific move does. We don't have to look any further than his boss appearances in Brawl for that. But let's look at what was taken. His down air, a move where he hurries down for dinner, is a move he could do in all his 3D game appearances, although the lack of flames make this one likely to be based on his other M battle. The first two attacks in his jab animation is similar to the move he performs in Samus Returns. Although, as that game was made at the same time as Smash, this could be a coincidence. His forward smash with the explosion of flame directly in his mouth could be based on a similar attack from Other M as well. The rest of Ridley's moves, however, they're all original. Not Captain Falcon, I'm gonna do some flips and shit original, as there are some basis for why these moves appear. Traditionally, Ridley has had four ways of attacking in his games. Fire expelling from his gullet, stabbing with his slinky tail, clawing away with his claws, and occasionally trying to clamp down on his opponents like a two-bite brownie. Though the biting doesn't have as many concrete references as the others. First, his plasma breath. This is an ability really has had since the NES days, and as Smash loves projectiles for their neutral specials, it's the perfect fit. The ability to charge and fire multiple fireballs that bounce along the ground is a reference to Super Metroid and Zero Mission, where they had the same ability. Another really neat attention to detail is that if you shoot Ridley in the mouth during this animation, he takes extra damage, referencing the same weakness he had in every game appearance. Him and his slimy trap. Next, his tail. A multi-tool used for stabbing, swiping, stabbing, swinging, stabbing, and backflipping. And stabbing. His tail gives him a lot of reach and is his primary way of attacking in the 2D games. Lincoln, you might miss it in his super slow down special. Now, stabbing in this way is common for Ridley. However, the lack of knockback and the critical damage on the tip are a Smash original. The animation is similar to the way Ridley stabs his tail into the ground during some of his fights, but this goes horizontal instead. Next up, something he mainly attacks within the 3D games, his claws. Ridley can swing with his claws on both of his hands and feet, and takes full advantage of them in Smash. In his dash attack, he even goes in for a bite, something he does in Metroid Prime 3. And I guess in terms of references, nothing brings it all together like Ridley's Final Smash. Taking his opponents out for a night on the town on Samus' spaceship with a side of blah. This kinetic breath weapon has been seen in the Metroid Prime games from Meta Ridley, but this actual scene itself isn't a reference to any scene in particular. However, it communicates the overall essence of the character, as well as his undying hate for Samus and her ship. And that's basically it for Smash Ridley. However, an interesting addition to a lot of his moves are his wings. They're used for a handful of attacks in Smash Brothers, but they're never quite used the same in his home games, because flying? But in Smash, he's slamming them into the ground, stabbing them up in the air, basically using them as another limb. For example, Ridley's up special is similar to his dash attack in Prime 3. However, he stabs his wings up in the air and stomps his feet in Smash. But the wing stabbing, it's a Smash original. So, why make him do something that he wouldn't actually do? Well, similar to Charizard, it's the closest and most fitting way to represent Ridley flying and attacking without breaking the balance of the game. Remember how that worked out? Which brings us to his overall design. And the remaining question, how does Ridley succeed in conveying the menacing, monstrous manslayer? I guess it's no surprise, but this leads us right back to Sakurai's design philosophy. And this is something we will probably mention a lot in this series, but it relates back to Sakurai's game developer conference all the way back in 2008. Here, he talked a lot about character design and the importance of designing characters for Super Smash Bros. Brawl, as well as the whole series. We got a link to this on the Source Gaming website down below. Most importantly, Sakurai highlights the importance of silhouettes and character motion in effectively communicating character design. So, making Smash Ridley, they had to ask, what are Ridley's most standout features? His menacing claws, his big head, his spiky tail, and his huge wings. These are the four biggest visual parts of Ridley, and are what players will immediately associate with the character. In the heat of a 4-8 to eight player battle, you need moves and actions that reflect how your character can move. You wouldn't see Ridders pulling out a blunderbuss, or body slamming characters, yelling, RID RIDLEY! But using his wings, that's noticeable, and it feels natural, so of course use it. This way of designing characters is vital to Sakurai's design process, 
and we will see time and time again in future episodes. It highlights the importance of representing a character and the success of bringing him to Smash. Of course, they had to heavily alter what Ridley was capable of, but what we were greeted to was pure animosity. His taunts and victory animations support this too. There isn't much else they can do here other than make him look creepy and terrifying. And I think they succeed. Although, I don't know why this side taunt is making him do a Sonic the Hedgehog, but everything from his entrance to taunt to victory animations. They nail Ridley from the beginning of a battle to the end where he smirks across his cunning jaw. All the way down to the tiny details, the team at Sakurai understood how to bring Ridley to life without losing what made him so big. Overall, he does lose some of his monstrous traits when he's around the same size as Yoshi, but I do admit that Sakurai does succeed in creating Ridley. He heightens many of the menacing traits he's known for and achieves the form of Ridley that is scary. And not many Smash characters can say the same thing, so it just goes to show you the age-old saying is true. Size doesn't always matter. Thanks for watching.